Hello and welcome to Journeys and Journals. I'm Bernie Martin Beck and I get to meet the most fascinating people that live here in Southern Oregon and Northern California. You never know where my next guest is going to come from. This one I met behind the camera and I'd like you to meet Mel. Welcome. Thank you. Now this is a volunteer job you do here at Better Life Television. Correct. But you understand cameras and mountains and Technology from where? From KOBI, Channel 5, and also before that from Eugene there in KZI. Now you're a technician, is that a? I'm a transmitter technician. Transmitter yeah. technician. And not down at the station? No, not at the studio, no. What's the location that you did your work? King Mountain. It's uh, out of uh, Wolf Creek, about 12 miles up what? Coyote Creek Road. Way out there. How many miles up? I mean, do you know the elevation oh, yeah. for King? Yeah, the elevation of the main building is 5,120 feet. The, but we're, the main building is about a quarter of a mile from the point, and the point is 5,273, which is why they call it Mile High King Mountain, because it's only seven feet under a true mile. Oh, so you put a ladder up there at the point, and you're on a mile high. <laughs> right. Well, now, how in the world did a guy like you get a job on top of the mountain? Well, I was in electronics for several years and uh, living in Eugene, and I heard that uh, KEZI needed a transmitter technician, so I went up and interviewed for the job, and they gave it to me. And I worked, as I say, for about 12 years there. And uh, then uh, they were going to go full remote, which means they wouldn't need me there. And so about then there was a man retired here at KOBI and they needed one down here. So I just transferred down here. Mm. I transferred at uh, right after Christmas of 78. I worked right up to Christmas in Eugene. I came to work right down here after Christmas, one day after Christmas. <laughs> oh, lots of vacation oh, time yeah. there, right? <laughs> Well, my history with KOBI, K-Boy, um, is just, I mean, so much of my childhood seems to be wrapped around the new TV set that there was nothing on it but snow. And then when the TV set got a test pattern, <laughs> And then when it got flickering of this and that, I mean, it was big stuff here in Southern Oregon. 51 years ago? 53, well, it started in 53 is my understanding. Oh. And it was, I believe, the, either the first or the second station in the whole state of Oregon. It was, and it's a family-owned station. It's right. not just big-time network. Right. It's affiliated with NBC, but it, now it's NBC. It's but it used to be ABC, and it used to be. <laughs> I think they sort of tried them all. It might have, yeah. But it's always had that local imprint. Oh, definitely. Oh, and uh, my husband was there on doing a college program about oh. physics. Oh, great. Back then, they had a lot of uh, local people mm -hmm. on the show. Mm -hmm. That was, they had uh, someone come up and talk about literature, a mm. Dr. Christ, that I've had here on this show. 50 mm. years ago, he was talking literature to Southern Oregon. And how did you get involved with, well, let's face it, Smolens? Well, uh, as I said, this man retired here, and uh, Bill Kirk was the chief engineer here at that time, and uh, he was uh, on good terms with the chief engineer there at KZI. And so uh, when he needed a man, and he knew that KZI was going to no longer need men, why uh, he spoke to the chief engineer up there and said, uh, send one of them down here. Oh, and so, I was lucky it was you. So I came down and interviewed, and they hired me down here. Wonderful. Mel, um, you know, I was so lucky to be there the night that it opened. The, you, we went up to Mount, oh dear, what's the mountain that it transmitted off of? Blackwell Hill. Oh, that's where the, the original one, yes. And that's where the studio was, and we went up. My dad was uh, Mayor of Grants Pass, and so they 
did the ribbon cutting, and I got to be in on uh, probably cookies and punch. <laughs> and it was a fun night. I mean, I thought it was here. We'd already been looking at the test pattern in the blank TV mm -hmm. station. Um, we'd seen TV in Southern California, mm -hmm. so we knew that something really was going to change, and it has changed oh, yeah. our whole area. Mm -hmm. What's TV done for you? Well, it may, gave me a living, really, you might say. I started out uh, working for Litton Industries there in San Carlos after I got out of electronics college. And then uh, I uh, worked there for about three years. And then I got tired of that area and decided to come back to Oregon. And Come so back to Oregon. Is that familiar <laughs> to an awful lot of you guys? We had our web feet roots. Oh, yeah. So then I went to work uh, in two-way radio, and uh, I was working in two-way radio, two radio when I heard about this opening at the television station. Well, let's talk just a little bit about the Smullen, um, I guess they built this, didn't they? Yes, in, in 68 they built that building and set up that antenna system and everything. Would you folks believe the snow up there? What's the tallest snow. The, the deepest I saw it was twice. It was up to seven feet deep there. They kept it. They kept a hotel registry. These are the people that Visited. actually came Act up to visit. Right. And uh, you know, I, I was tickled because I put these pictures in. When you think of an antenna and this guy climbing, right? Oh, yeah. I mean, you you use climbers, or what do you use? Well, when you're climbing the tower, well, you have a safety belt to fasten on when you work. But other than that, you just climb up. They've got a ladder built right into the side of it. Yeah, but on a windy day? Well, I was never up on that particular tower on a windy day, but I spent three nights working on uh, the one there at KZI, and the third night we had about a 35-knot wind. Woo! And we... Uh, we're changing out waveguide at the base of the antenna at about the 190 foot uh, level there. This one here, I went up to the 200 foot level to change out a side light. But uh, when I first came down here, uh, Paul White was doing their climbing for him. So I didn't have to do any climbing for him for about six years. So uh, a windy night. Uh, you can't leave the TV station off, although there are times you have no choice, really, right? Yeah. Now this is the antenna. I had to put two pictures yeah, together to yeah. get it all? That's pretty much it. Yeah, there's still a little bit missing there in the middle there. but Oh, even more. And how many feet? Well, the tower is 268 feet, Ooh. and the antenna takes it up to a total of 313 feet. Now, one of the interesting things that I had in this picture, in this uh, registry here, you pointed out a man that came up to help you I thought it looked like a <laughs> monkey on the side of the building. Uh, they were uh, replacing the windows in the building there, and the windows were only on the second floor and on the east side. And it's built on a slope, so the east side uh, is the down slope side. So those windows were about, uh, oh, close to 20 feet above the ground there. So he, no wonder he looks like a little monkey <laughs> hanging on for dear life. Um, fascinating. What are some of the guests that came to your to visit you? Oh yeah. Well, of course, there was a lot of local people that came up there, especially, right. especially uh, young people from Glendale area. They they love to come up there and and uh, just spend the evening, you know. And uh, the uh, but we also had visitors from out of town, out of state, out of country. Even we had uh, two different people from uh, New Zealand. One from Here. the North Island and one from the South Island. Here they are, registered in your book, hotel yeah. registry. <laughs> you didn't have beds for them, no, though, I'm did you? No, not. You had your own? Oh, yeah. Yeah, we had complete living facilities in the building there. Yeah. Like a three-room apartment? or Well, what? It, uh, upstairs was where the bedrooms were, and uh, one of them was a full-size bedroom, you might say, and the other one was kind of a bunk room. And... Uh, then downstairs we had a kitchen and dining area, and uh, the uh, but it was right where you were you know, 
right off the, you might say, the entrance to the dining room was the, the hallway along which the equipment was setting. And you weren't up there alone? Well, yeah, I was up there on, alone a number of times uh, before my wife started going up. And uh, the man that was working there, uh, the other shift from me when I started was Paul White. And uh, he, had, I guess, when he started, which was right after they built that, he started in 68. Why uh, his wife went up with him a time or two, but they had small children, and as soon as the kids had to go to school, why she quit going up there? But you were like the only person up there. All right. I mean, At the, times, you yeah. and oh ho ho ho. In fact, uh, the first Christmas I was up there, I was there all alone. That would have been the Christmas of '79, and uh, I thought, you know, I was going to see nobody for the whole Christmas day, and then a uh, brother and sister combination came in on cross country skis. Oh. and visited me for a few minutes, and that was a nice little break. When you say uh, cross-country skis, you got a pair here. Yes. These are your very own? Those are mine, yes. Uh, why did you use skis? Because... Well, I, uh, the company provided snowshoes like these. I mean, those are old-fashioned yeah, well, snowshoes. They're old-fashioned, but they're very much like the ones that the company had. Leather straps to yeah. keep them on your feet. You're right. And I, uh, I used them a time or two, but I really didn't like snowshoes. And so even though I had never had any lessons or anything in using cross-country skis, I went ahead and bought this pair of cross-country skis. And you said, I can do that. And uh, I found out that I could uh, use them. I, I got along fine as long as uh, I was going uphill or was going on the level. The only place I had any problems was when I was going downhill because I didn't know how to control my speed. Okay. And so whenever I began to get going faster and I felt it was safe, I'd just flop sideways into the snow, you know. That's and called breaking it, <laughs> isn't it? <laughs> and then I'd get back on my feet and take off again until I needed to do it again. Well, but, you're uh, a very smart feller. It made the job, and I got it. One time there, I, uh, after I'd been using the skis for quite some time, I was going to go from the building up to the point, which was about, as I say, a quarter of a mile away from the building there. And uh, we just had a whole bunch of fresh powder snow. And I started out with the cross-country skis, and I was sinking into this fresh snow uh, over my knees. And so, uh, and when I got to the steeper part of the hill, I decided, no, this is not going to work, you know, because it was really uh, a muscle strain, shall we say, oh. it was building up a sweat, you know, trying to, to get uh, through the snow and uh, I was sinking in so deep. So I went back to the building there and got the snowshoes, even though I don't like to use the snowshoes, and started out. I got about the same distance and I was sinking in almost to my knees with the snowshoes. And so I decided, well, Fortunately, going up to the point was something that I could postpone, and so... <laughs> Smart man! <laughs> so Smart. I went back to the studio and postponed it until the snow had a chance to settle. Once the, uh, there's been a day or two when it's warmed up a little bit and the snow has had a chance to saw a little bit and sag and then freeze again, why, then you, know, you can go across it real easy with either one. You know, you've got so much excitement here. This is about a snow cat. Why? That's, that's how we transported the snowcat back and forth from the studio. And they would drive up as far as they could go with the truck without getting stuck. And then they would unload the snowcat and we'd come on the rest of the way in with the snowcat. Is this is every winter? Every winter, yeah. Okay, you've got a snor story about the snowcat that I wanted you to tell. Well, I've got a couple of them, yeah. Please. The, uh, for many years there, they had done it, as I said, they would keep the snowcat at the studio and haul it up there and use it to take the person that was going on shift in and then bring the person that was coming off shift out. Well, this one winter, they decided that they weren't going to need the snowcat any other, for any other purposes, and so they decided to keep the snowcat up on the mountain. And uh, the person that was on shift, when he got ready to go off, he'd drive the snowcat down and meet the truck and then the person coming in would drive it back up. Well, well that makes sense. Yeah, the, uh, the trouble was the first, very first shift that they did that, the man that was on the uh, on the mountain at that time, which fortunately wasn't me, <laughs> he uh, decided to drive it from the building up to the point, and uh, he went across a kind of a ridge and down into a gully-like in the process, 
and succeeded in breaking a rear axle <laughs> on the snowcat. Oh. And this snowcat was unique in that it was built by the University of Utah as an experimental unit, and uh, it was uh, had an industrial Ford six engine. It, now that's not a motor, uh, an automobile type Ford six. engine. It's an industrial type Ford engine, and uh, it had been put together out of whatever they could come up with, and you could not buy spare parts for it. And so when they what? broke that axle, what they had to do was dismount that, that rear axle, take it off the mountain. With a, they had some other small, smaller snowcats, and take it the, down there and have a machine shop make them a brand new axle using the old one as a pattern. Do you have any idea what machine shop they went to? No, I don't. We It'd had Mr. Fix's welding here who <laughs> could do almost anything. Uh, Fixins was, uh, you know, they had sometimes to go on a train oh. out to where a train was broken down. Oh, yeah. So your story fits right <laughs> in with that. Well, now, you've got pictures over there that tell me you weren't ever alone on well, the mountain. Well, this here was what happened when we was going on shift one time and uh, in fact, it was the last winter we was up there, uh, the winter of uh, uh, 95, 96, because uh, I, as I say, retired at the end of November of 96. And uh, there'd been a wind, pretty heavy wind, uh, the night before we went on shift. And as we was going up there with the snowcat, up about, oh, maybe half a mile before we got up to the building there, here was this tree had been dropped down across the road. Enormous tree. Yes, it was, I measured it after it was cut and it was a full three feet through. And wow. uh, it, uh, because of the fact that it was on a hillside so that on this side down here, it slope dropped off quite sharply. And up here you had a bank and then heavy trees and, and stuff up here. There's no way we could go around the tree. And because it wasn't laying on the road, but coming across it above the road like that, there was no way we could climb over it. If it had been laying on the road, they could have, we could have shoveled up some snow on each side and it would, sure. the snow cat would have just climbed right over top of it. So, so what did you do? Well, we had to turn around and go back and uh, they used the uh, two-way radio to let the studio know what the situation was. And the studio knew somebody that was a logger and they contacted that person and had him come and meet us down uh, at the, uh, where we had unloaded the snowcat. And then we loaded him and his equipment in and we took him back up there and he went ahead and cut the tree out of the way. But right. of course, we had to cut it into about firewood sized chunks because if it had been just one big chunk, there was no way we could have moved it out of the way once it was cut. No. So he would cut it into firewood sized chunks and we would roll those pieces off to the side of the road until he finally got a big enough opening in the tree to where we could get through with the snowcat. Did you use wood for fire up there? Or? No, it was all electric, completely electric. We had a, a 25,000 watt generator up there. Oh, that, and well, uh, you're gonna keep the station on, you're gonna oh, yeah. keep the lights on. And the place warmed up. And it uh, diesel powered, of course. They had a 3,000 gallon fuel tank under the floor for diesel for running that thing. Whoa, sitting on dynamite, huh? Well, no, a diesel, you know, is not like gasoline. Uh, you but could drop you a match into diesel and it wouldn't have happened. But didn't you have lightning and things like that on the mountain? Well, yeah, we had some lightning, but it didn't affect the uh, diesel or the generator. Anymore. Or the antenna? Well, no, we never had any problem with it affecting the antenna. Well, this was the picture I thought I was pulling up. Um, you had visitors, other oh, visitors yeah. on oh, the yeah. mountain. <laughs> what was it like? Well, we had lots of wildlife around there and we had this fire pit real close to the front porch there that where we burned our paper type trash. Uh, the rest of it we took off the mountain and, and they put it in a dumpster down at the studio. But uh, the deer just loved the ashes and they'd come up and eat the uh, ashes out of the fire pit. Did and you have other wildlife besides oh deer yeah. and people? Oh yeah. we. Uh, we twice, uh, there was one time we looked out of the window and we saw two bobcats <gasps> playing together out, oh. out in front of the building there a little ways. And then we saw coyotes and we saw uh, a bear one time. We had, we were allowed to go for a walk away from the building, 
but we carried a radio with us. So if there was a problem in the building, why we would rush back, you sure. know, they would contact us and we'd rush back. So we could leave the building as long as we didn't go so far, but what we could get back in a hurry, you know. If we could get back in five to ten minutes, that was all that was required. So we had decided to take this walk uh, along this little road that uh, went around the side of the uh, point there. And uh, there was a gully came up through that, that area where that road was. And we had just passed the head of that gully walking away from the building there when uh, my wife looked down the gully and saw this bear coming up the gully. And so oh. we stopped and watched. and. It was a real nice big black bear, and he was shiny. It was the first day of September, so he, he was, was good and fat, good and fat, and nice and shiny. And he, he was moving right along. He, uh, uh, we don't know for sure. We thought maybe some uh, dogs down below had been put on his trail or something like that, and he decided to leave that area and head move for over. the high country. So he. Uh, he came right on up to the road that we was on and uh, turned away from us and uh, went along the road for maybe 20 yards or something like that and then he went on up over the top of the ridge and then down on the other side. Just sauntering off. He did, you yeah. didn't disturb he, him and no, he didn't he disturb, didn't disturb you. us, but he uh, as I say he was he wasn't running all out, you know. I mean like he was but he was not pausing to smell the roses, you might say. He was just <clears throat> making tracks. Speaking of roses, I saw wildflower pictures that you've taken up on top of the mountain. Yeah, there's the one there. That's and the not one. only did they have flowers on the, on the uh, mountain, wildflowers, these were delicate, Those beautiful. Those are wildflowers, yes. And uh, right below the point, see, at one time, many years ago, the point had a fire lookout on it. By the time that I started working up there, they had removed the, uh, the fire lookout, and all that was left was the bases for the tower that the fire looks had. But at the time that they'd had people up there during the summer on fire lookout, they needed water, of course. And down below the point there a little ways, they had found a spring, and they had boxed the spring in, and it had a uh, pipe coming out of the side uh -huh. of it and uh, water would dribble out of the pipe and then it would run down the hillside for oh maybe 50 yards before it sank into the ground because it wasn't a real big flow but it was enough to, to uh, for their purposes. Well that area that was being constantly watered is where those flowers uh, bloomed Oh. and uh, the uh, the deer loved them. You had to, if you wanted to get pictures of them or to pick them, you had to get there fairly early because oh, as soon as they started to go to seed, why the deer were there and ate them up. Lunchtime. Well, these are not wildflower pictures. This is not a picture up there. No. But it is a picture up there. Why don't you describe well? Well, I. Uh, one of the things we did to pass time up there was to do crossword puzzles, and, and we jigsaw also did puzzles? jigsaw puzzles. We did both, pro crossword puzzles and jigsaw puzzles, and uh, those are pictures of jigsaw puzzles that we took, and we did a, a whole bunch of them. I never counted to see how many pictures we had. But well, we he showed a, me about 30 or 40 yeah, pictures yeah, we, of, pic of the puzzles. Yes, we, we uh, took pictures of each puzzle after we'd finish it. Post Magazine, don't you folks just remember those magazines and what fun it was to get that in the mail and see what the latest picture that uh, had been on the cover. These are quite famous now. Oh yeah, yeah. But down here's pictures and this is not up on any mountain. No, those are my place. So you live down in the valley now oh, yeah. and grow? I live in uh, River Haven Mobile Estates. These gorgeous gladiolus. I can, uh, oh our valley used to just bloom with gladiolus. Yeah. Thousands upon thousands. And they were sold for their bulb not for their blossom because there wasn't air transportation out of here. and So they would cut them and use them for Gladiola Festival. It was such a high point here. Um, oh, you've got some other pictures. These are what? Those are piles of rocks that were done by uh, the man that worked the other shift from me, Paul White. That was how he got his exercise and how he killed time. He'd get out and build these rock piles and then people coming up would see him and think, say, well, is this an Indian burial ground or something <laughs> like that, you know? <laughs> oh, oh, yeah. But yeah. He, he, we counted some one time and he made more afterwards, but we counted over 200 of them at that time. And he was still- Pyramids, still gone, building them. Southern Oregon. 
This is your wife. That's my wife, and she's standing in front of one of the anchors for the tower there. Oh, they and a couple of those pyramids. Yeah. Well, let's just talk in our closing minutes about what this is all about. The lowest pictures there are when Patsy Smullen, the owner of uh, KOBI, brought the whole studio crew up to King Mountain for a uh, picnic about uh, uh, July, August, somewhere along there in the middle of the summer, you know, when it was nice weather up there. Actually, I think one of the reasons that they chose that particular time to come up there is we never had real hot weather up there. The hottest I ever saw it up there was 82 degrees. And when it was 82 degrees there, it was reported to be 114 in Medford. Ooh, now we know where to go on a hot day. <laughs> you know, Patsy's been so kind to us here at Better Life Television. She asked me to be on her show, so I said, turn about fair play. And um, she was very influential in using the uh, Deb Potts films that I've been able to interview Debs and to use those in the memorial service, even in, even in Salem, in the capital. She's been a strong supporter, and I certainly appreciate it. She's going to get a picture, yeah, a, copy get a copy of this, of this for right. you. Yeah. Because she's as interested in your story as the folks out home are. Patsy and the whole crew yeah. up on top of King Mountain. Right. That you, deck, by the way, that you see behind in that picture there, uh, I built that. They uh, didn't have anything there, and uh, we wanted some place to be outdoors, and yet, you know, right next to the building. And so I told them, well, I'll build you a deck if you'll provide the materials. So. Oh, that's it, a deal. Oh, yeah. So they provided the materials, and I built a deck for Mel, them. Mel, why don't you put on your hat, and it says, go hike the canyon. Folks, may I just encourage you to go and hike, whether you hike on the flat, out where the bears are, or up on top of the mountain. Get a little exercise and have a lot of fun, because it, obviously it agrees with us. A good smile and fresh air and definitely thank you so much for being my guest Mel. I've enjoyed it and thanks for standing behind that camera and uh, taking good pictures all this time too and also I climb towers you climb towers you for should. BLTV oh you do oh yeah he's not done yet <laughs>